tall enough to not make it. So he'll be doing double or triple duty, representing the, 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 the group, representing both of you. Uh, that we know that you can, you have visited this kind of occasion before. Let me just give you a, a framework in which uh, we uh, very joyously invited uh, Mr. Rosenthal here. That is an effort that we began a, a year or so ago uh, to bring back political economy. One of those academic, scholarly <coughs> gestures, uh, which we see, thought were very, very uh, in, important in part and view of the uh, Euro and other crises that we made, uh, in 2008. Uh, in part, had a feeling or a knowledge around Claudia that there actually were quite a number of people who have engaged in questions of the political economy, historical, cultural perspective, but for all sorts of reasons over the last couple of decades, in which some of them have been practicing here, teaching here, but we haven't necessarily gotten together. And this is particularly so in terms of thinking about Europe, thinking about Europe in the wider world, thinking about Europe in the framework also of the virgin studies on China, uh, which have created a you know, great amount uh, of numbers of questions about the nature of Europe exceptionalism, and also the nature of uh, Sino exceptionalism. So that, if you want, was the background uh, for this uh, in, in endeavor. I, I should add, that it was also in terms of a kind of academic politics, that is, we felt that so much of the work uh, that had been done in Columbia recently in the realm of economics, business school, uh, you know, apart by our very eminent Nobel Prize uh, winners, in part by the extraordinary school of development politics, you know, Earth Institute doesn't really do the kind of work uh, that uh, we feel should be done, doesn't have to engage in a, a historical perspective uh, with uh, the other endeavors, especially thinking about uh, what is happening in the world. So with that larger uh, sort of agenda, uh, we hope that you'll all be able to contribute uh, to what we wanted to first present briefly what we see coming ahead and come back to show you how we are uh, so welcome within it. So we had hoped to uh, begin with Charles Mayer and local colleagues speaking about just the very problem of bringing back the global economy in Europe around zero. Uh, now we are beginning to address the California school and the questions that they've raised around divergence and convergence, very, very eminent. We will look forward to have welcome Jorwin Kalka, uh, who has come back with work on social history, institutional economic history. He, he's been working on varieties of capitalism, so we'll look forward to welcoming him again. Uh, we had already thought he was going to come, however, he feels now that he's got to deal with a bigger world, that he's too much euro focus if he's gone back to the book, so he will come to us probably in the next fall. We uh, will be working around Carl Benerlin and another colleagues work on mercantilism, and we hope to we bring in Peter Hall, who has worked on varieties of capitalism, which I call the Harvard School, I'm not sure if they call it that. And in the process, we hope that we'll have a Columbia School, and uh, I will introduce some elements of that uh, when we, uh, after we start. But let me start by introducing Ben Wong, who's coming to us from UCLA, uh, where he is directed many research programs and new initiatives around a the Asian studies field. As many of you know, his own research has examined Chinese patterns of political, economic, and social change, especially since the 18th century. Uh, his first work, if I understand it, was on the political economy of food supplies in, uh, in, in, in China. Uh, and then his very important book uh, was published in 1997 on China Transformed, Historical Change and the Limits of European Experience, a work that the Europeans have simply not uh, engaged uh, enough. But Patrick's work, uh, bold and intellectually ambitious, uh, and wholly original and a real challenge to the social sciences. Uh, and again, it's interesting that until this more recent work, in some ways, the Europeans have not sufficiently engaged, and certainly not the US, but I, I find also not uh, 
do it sufficiently in Europe, at least not part of the contemporary Europeanism. Uh, his, his interest in, uh, which he's developed in his earlier work, is the subject of three score at least of articles, which have been published in many languages and in journals in the academy, but also in other voices outside of the academy. So they've had a very significant influence in thinking both about Chinese development, about European development, but the development uh, uh, more, more generally. Uh, after cogent and sounds like remarkably friendly critiques of his colleague uh, Kenneth Pomerantz's book, The Great Divergence, 2000, which is how I became initially acquainted with your work, uh, he teamed up with Jean-Luc Rosenthal and Caltech to write Before and Beyond Divergence, The Politics of Economic Change in China and Europe, which came out uh, hardly in 2012. Uh, and that's going to be the subject of this talk today. Afterward, I will introduce colleagues, uh, Richard Bullitt, uh, Arthur Howe, and Madden uh, Zeller, who will give comments, and then we'll open up the discussion. Um, thank you for inviting me and Jean-Laurent Rosenthal here. It's a great disappointment, I'm sure, to many in the room, uh, perhaps most especially me, that he's not here, um, uh, to share in the excitement of, of speaking before a gathering which I hope has people both from the European uh, studies part of the campus as well as from the East Asian part. I notice both institutes are represented. I also notice that the Weatherhead has a banner roughly half the width of the European, but also spatially placed in front. And I still don't quite understand the, the, uh, the symbolic significance, the, the, the manner in which I should read that uh, spatial placement. But I'm conscious that they're both behind me. Uh, and I'm speaking to you, though, in fact, I find it very hard, I can't, I have to choose, I mean, unless I want to get a strained neck, I really can't keep track of all of you in terms of, uh, as I look out. So anyway, I won't even pretend, uh, really try. Uh, I do want to say that uh, if Jean Laurent, th this talk is a talk by Jean Laurent and myself. Um, we have presented the book in different venues, individually and together. We really consciously conceive this as an ABAB -A -B presentation. This beginning would have been by him. He's at least, he's probably not quite a foot, nine inches taller than I am, much deeper voice. And as a Europeanist, he, the remarks he would open with, um, he would have given with more gusto than I feel confident in doing. But I'm going to still open with the remarks that he and I uh, set up together and then move through the talk. Uh, and one of the disadvantages not having him here is that the discipline of going A, B, A, B, and knowing we only have 25 to 30 minutes, he gets very impatient. And so I would have been careful not to stray. But there's so many tempting things to talk about in the context of the introduction. Thinking about Europe, it's Im the importance of the political economy, the EU. Part of this book where it ends up, which I'm not going to talk about much today, is an argument that finally Europe in the early 21st century is confronting some of the kinds of problems of scale that Chinese regimes have been repeatedly confronting for centuries. And so that some of the issues that we think of as being suprastate are suprastate in the European world region. Within a Chinese context, they've been what's been within a single polity for a long time. And the issue of the size of our units, the, the way they work, um, there are a lot of fruitful uh, issues that we can come that, we, that, that come to us when we don't naturalize one set of experiences as the norms according to which we uh, judge the others. But that's actually not what I'm going to specifically talk about. I'm going to introduce this book, uh, give you an overview of the book. Um, I'm going to then talk about how it is different from what Ken Pomeranz does in The Great Divergence. It's related to, but a different approach. Then I'm going to exemplify some of the arguments in the book by walking through one chapter in particular. And then finally, I'm going to uh, suggest the kind of agenda for research that we think uh, is worth pursuing and that we consciously wrote the book thinking about how we could make statements that would help um, sort of propose a way to think about how social science history, uh, at least one of the ways it can be uh, more effectively pursued. Um, and so you can see the teapots. That was the symbolism here. Uh, initially, Harvard gave us a Japanese uh, iron teapot. 
which I thought aesthetically was much more lovely, but regrettably inappropriate. Um, and I could not find a persuasive uh, way to displace that ugly uh, pot on the right. And I guess, uh, I guess not to sort of get essentialist, they put Jean Laurent under this Chinese pot and me under that other kind of pot. Any event, uh, there we have it. Um, so part one, motivation and outline. In thinking about coming here and talking to an audience, thinking that we're sponsored first and foremost by the European Institute here, thinking about in the history of ideas, China and Asia more generally holds a special place for Europeans thinking from the Enlightenment forward about politics. Um, themes of there being either a wise emperor or an evil emperor. And those themes were complemented in the 18th century by the classical economists, sp specifically Smith and Malthus, and, and the images they gave us in related ways of systems of economy in which populations grow, and in which, uh, with Smith, according to the institutions, reach a certain kind of equilibrium scale of uh, height of growth. And this leads in the Malthusian uh, version of this to the notion, of course, of populations growing to a point where uh, they're at their, uh, in a subsistence kind of equilibrium and the danger of, of overpopulation. It seems that these kind of framings are related also to how we do economic history professionally in the early 21st century where we are still very much animated in part at least by the desire of at least some of the people in this field implicitly or at times explicitly to take pride or at least credit in being the cradle of modern economic growth. And increasingly, it seems to me, one can understand this as a kind of nostalgia, but I'm not gonna go into that kind of issue. Um, my wife works in London, so I'm acutely aware of the actual state of the British economy and its infrastructure in London, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I, as I say, I'm not gonna, I'll, be I'll pretend Jean Laurent's staring at me and getting ready to grumble if I go off on something like that. So instead, I'll talk about that within this context, economic historians, have who don't work on China but who um, aspire to make broader statements have frequently invoked the political system of China as in imperial times as a source for the failure of China to become more prosperous. At the same time, we do from the, in the earlier part of the Enlightenment in the 18th century have this vision of China's peaceful and prosperous. So what I'm stressing is that within the history of ideas, China has appeared in both positive and in negative lights. That's true in the 18th century, and it's, in fact, true today. Um, and these have a lot to do in the 18th century with political debates in Europe, much more than what they said about what was going on in China. And that even today, if we go through and we think about our current context of a global economy in which we really have anxieties about differences in rates of growth, um, the impact of changes in China on our economic situation, there is a consistent um, desire to both praise and blame China today. In California, in the newspapers in the last couple of weeks, there are articles that praise China in reference to the, our, California's desperate need to develop some kind of public transportation involving high-speed trains. And in the same newspapers, there are all kinds of stories in the business pages about problems of trade, desires to restrict what the Chinese are doing, penalize them for this, that, or the other. A lot of these discussions uh, in the strongest form of, of presentation, could, we could say, tell us really little about how China works itself, but much more about what makes us anxious, either things we don't have or things we're worried about losing. And for that matter, Chinese do very similar exercises there in terms of using the U.S. as a mirror <coughs> to view both their advantages and disadvantages or their strengths and weaknesses as defined by different political groups. So this exercise is not a peculiarly American exercise or European one, it's one people seem to do with some regularity uh, around the world. Uh, but the key is it doesn't really produce new knowledge. Um, Jean Laurent wrote this slide so it says scientific. I try to avoid that, um, that uh, claim, but he's, he's, an, he's a hardcore economist so he believes in that. Uh, and, I, and actually I, I believe in some of that too. I, should be, I, I gotta be careful here. This, there is a party line and I am part of the party. Uh, uh, but so Jean Laurent and I decided there is a whole lot of research on China and Europe, but it's hard to access and evaluate on one's own if one's an outsider to a literature 
that it really is important to bring the research together in a certain way. So I'm going to uh, review some, somewhat of how we came into this book and stress that we do not aim at a new synthesis. We're not aiming at anything grand. But we do claim to be offering at least what we think is a framework for thinking about issues and addressing them ad seriatim, recognizing that issues addressed in, in a more analytically focused and empirical manner can over time build up a, a, a more solid base of knowledge. <coughs> So the book has the following chapters. We talk about space and politics. This has to do with the difference between empire and, and from an imperial perspective, fragmented political space. I'll say more about that later. We have a chapter on demography and the way demography is used with relation to economic growth, both in Malthus, the classical economist, and more recently. Uh, chapter three on formal and informal mechanisms has to do with the nature of trade, and I'm gonna go through that chapter, some of its key arguments uh, with you in a moment. Chapter four, which is in many ways our explanation of why there was a divergence, uh, I will speak about briefly later as well. The last uh, two substantive chapters are about first credit markets, meaning private finance, and then about public finance, uh, chapters five and six. And then we end with a broader uh, uh, thematic sweep of how to think about growth and the political economies of growth since, uh, between 1500 and, and the beginning of the, uh, the post-World War II uh, beginning of the post-World War II era. Okay, so breaking away from the Great Divergence debate, um, we um, started this project many years ago uh, thinking about it and, and periodically thinking we should write something. We ended up writing two or three papers together and decided that we should really get serious and, and plot out uh, six chapters or so and, and, and create a book. And then over the last, uh, I guess, between five and three years ago, that's what we did. Um, so there's really four elements that we thought quite consciously about. One is the economics and history as disciplines each has, uh, at least in some of their subfields, conceptual coherence. And, and the demands of what we're studying means we have to be analytically coherent. And from history especially, we have to be empirically plausible. Uh, economists love to use stylized facts uh, which simplify, and there's really a point to simplifications. But when the simplifications reach the point of simply being untenable, having untenable relations to reality, the historians in each of us um, rebels and says that's not a set of principles worth pursuing. So empirical plausibility and conceptual coherence, the effort to sustain both through the use of comparable information that's symmetric, meaning we have comparable, uh, that we're, we're, we're comparing, as it were, like and like rather than um, an example of not doing that would be looking at pawn shop interest rates in China versus public bond rates in Europe. They're two very different kinds of finance. There's no reason we should expect interest rates in one kind of situation to resemble those in another. Uh, so we need comparable kinds of uh, information about finance to, uh, to be able to make useful statements. So over several years that we um, discussed this book, uh, we made each other read a lot about the other region's history, and we uh, reflected some, quite carefully about what each discipline was demanding in terms of the types of questions it framed, the methods it used, and the types of data it found congenial. And we tried to uh, adjudicate amongst those how to come up with um, what we thought was a synthetic kind of narrative. And, if, and we were very conscious that we couldn't really address any topic where we thought we were lacking in one of the four elements. If we thought we, we couldn't be conceptually coherent about how something worked, if we didn't have enough empirical information, and if the China and Europe information weren't at least somewhat symmetric. There's much more written about Europe, so there's a constant uh, tension in effort to make China um, live up to the uh, sort of the empirical density of material on Europe. Uh, and even if it can't always do so, the, being mindful of the challenge and the problem strikes us as very important. So the rules of the game are we resist inductive temptation. Everyone who does comparison, or many people, tend to think have their favorite differences, but have no particular way of evaluating when differences that exist matter or don't matter. Part of what we do in the book is try to suggest differences, and I'll give you an example in a moment. Differences can exist, but how do they matter? Um, that turns out to be a quite challenging issue. The mere plausibility of differences mattering is inadequate for making claims that something's important. 
to make claims about what is important in terms of differences, we have to move down a level to look at specific problems, ones that Chinese and Europeans both face in terms of economic activities, and which they solve in one way or another so that we can actually evaluate what they see, what they do, and what the consequences of those efforts might be. So what are the implications of this for thinking about the great divergence? As I'm sure many of you are familiar with Ken, Ken Pomerance's important work of 2000, The Great Divergence, um, that book argues, and it's certainly uh, a claim that uh, more generally uh, also exists in part in China Transformed, uh, a book uh, Victoria mentioned that I uh, published as, uh, earlier, and that uh, many other scholars, many of whom were in the state of California, uh, mentally if not physically, uh, 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 started arguing in the 1990s and early 2000s. So uh, that there were important similarities uh, that, um, that mattered to, to getting a baseline for how things changed after the late 18th century. Uh, in Ken's case, he in Pomerantz's case, he stressed in particular European expansion into the New World and the importance of resources in the New World, the windfall gain that this created, uh, and he tied it in particular to the, um, the cotton textile experience. And he also uh, hung a lot on the uh, fortuitous location of coal uh, in Britain compared to its location um, in, the, in the Chinese mainland. So the, the great strength of this book, it seems to me, or one of its great strengths, is the way it has really engaged a broad range of scholars and students. Amongst economists, there's been a great effort to uh, get create new research on wages and prices, on costs of living. Uh, I think most economists believe now they've beaten back uh, the, the Pomerantz thesis about the comparability of standards of living. Uh, you know, the jury uh, is, may still be out, but there are many people betting on the jury coming back with a verdict that no, the Europeans were ahead of China uh, well before Pomerantz claims they were. Um, Rosenthal and Wong think that this is sort of a uh, in irrelevant exercise. That is, it doesn't matter what the precise quantity of difference is, what we really should be interested in is the mechanisms that will work in both parts of the world and explain why one set of mechanisms was more likely to create modern economic growth than the other. Um, at the same time as economists turned to doing new research, historians uh, were swept up with uh, thinking about connections, the, the way it framed and fit into interest in global history. Um, and in general, it really helped bring Chinese history into more general discussions of European and world history uh, in, a, in, a, in a very uh, productive manner um, that has persisted for the last decade. All right. There are critiques, of course. Uh, a lot of people have said, no, the New World resources are not that important for a variety of reasons. And the location of coal <coughs> is, is, is overstated in, in the book. There's a general, I would like to state it, however, in terms of the general problem of explaining individual historical cases that in many ways are distinct narratives. So that if you have a large scale and complex process, sorting out the significance of individual factors becomes extremely difficult. And essentially, if we define the Industrial Revolution to be that set of things that happened in England, and we label everything that happened there, in the end, what we're describing is what happened in England. We don't have it's very hard to know where the general story is in that, um, in, in the narrative. So before and beyond divergence, the book Rosenthal and I wrote really tried to be quite careful about thinking, what does it mean to, to develop a more general model of explaining what are the key factors that lead to modern economic growth as they appear empirically, uh, the plausibility of them appearing empirically in China and Europe. Um, so we, have, we wanted to obey, or, or obey, believe in, I'm, choose a verb, but we use economic principles, very straightforward um, economic principles, and we anchor it in major, uh, our reading of, of, of large amounts of historical evidence. So what we do and do not try to do, we're not trying to explain the British Industrial Revolution. That's in some ultimate sense a one-off event that has its own, a cluster of specificities. But so rather than get bogged down in what's historically particular to the British narrative, but may not be actually crucial to, to economic growth in a more general set of possibilities, we're trying to come up with, a, with causal mechanisms we think would have been crucial whether or not, for instance, you had New World cotton. Um, 
we tend to think that New World cotton was not essential. It certainly made a difference, but it's a second order kind of difference because unless there were a lot of other kinds of changes, New World cotton would never have mattered. Uh, and even if you needed New World cotton, did you have to get it the way Europeans got it? In other words, did you have to have the import of African slaves, et cetera, et cetera? Um, this is a large set of counterfactuals, but what we're trying to do is tease out the degree to which one can imagine a number of different situations in which some basic differences between China and Europe would still lead to divergence in, in, Ken's, in Ken Pomerantz's terms. So our thesis is that politics is very important because there's a key and persistent difference between China and Europe. Indeed, it's one that other scholars have noted before, but we think have, um, in the bluntest form, uh, fundamentally misread. The key is not some notion of autocracy versus democracy, but it's really spatial scale, and in particular the costs of war, which we think vary with spatial scale. So to put it in the simplest terms, in chapter four we argue that the persistent possibilities of warfare in early modern Europe led to an urban bias in the location of certain types of European manufacturing. That we have an assumption that urban sites for manufacturing are better, but empirically in the 16th and 17th centuries, wages were higher in, in the city, life expectancy was lower, uh, you had to, the cost of food was higher in the cities. Uh, it was cheaper, in fact, then to, cr to manufacture crafts in the countryside. And in China, um, after the late 14th century, increasingly we see uh, crafts in the countryside. And in Europe, in the late 17th and in the 18th century, we also see in that so-called proto-industrial moment in certain locations, both in England, the Zurich Highlands and other parts of the German-speaking areas, as well as a few French areas, we see um, manufacturing taking place in the countryside as well. Um, but we think by that point in time, there's still an urban bias that persists in Europe uh, that leads, uh, that that has an impact on subsequent development. Um, that the urban location of and bias of European manufacturing, which was in, in key ways uh, motivated by the fear of warfare, ends up later on with the unintended consequence of being more advantageous for the development of the economy because in cities, capital is cheaper relative to labor. That is to say, well, capital is cheaper in cities than it is in the countryside. It's cheaper to borrow. This has to do with of issues of um, surveillance and getting repaid, but labor is more expensive. So a difference in relative factor costs means that if, you're, if your industry is in cities, you're more likely to develop technologies that are going to use capital rather than use labor. And that kind of sort of economic demand-driven factor seems to us at least enough to tilt things in a direction that at some point you would expect a difference to emerge in the way these two economies, broadly speaking, uh, developed the use of capital and labor. Uh, now, in saying this, we also want to stress, this is the contrast that emerges to us by looking at Europe and China as examples of one place that had fragmented polities and another that had a large empire. It's not saying that all large political spaces are necessarily like China, nor is it saying that all places that have intense political competition and military warfare are like Europe. Um, you can have political competition and not have the other conditions that clearly also inform the ways the European political system develops. So it's in making comparisons between two parts of the world that are different, it's important to recognize this level of claim, uh, we consciously avoid saying that China is like all of the empires because we don't believe that, nor do we believe all places with small and competing polities have the same kind of political system. Um, and therefore, the contrast between China and Europe is between one particular and important world region with a set of competing polities and one important world region where the place was organized as, as empire. Now, the beyond divergence in our presentation um, is to say we that, that comparative economic history clearly includes ex some effort to explain why things diverge at a certain point in time or deciding when that is and what it was. But it includes many other things. And our book tries to explain how different societies tackle similar problems. And note that even if the solution to those problems don't directly and immediately affect the likelihoods of industrialization, 
they actually remain relevant well after industrialization processes begin and spread. And so one of our arguments is understanding dynamics before industrialization helps explain the nature of economic growth in different world regions um, even a century or two later. So let me move quickly to chapter uh, three uh, and part three of this presentation and talk about markets and institutions. So in chapter three, what we do is we, we walk through a analysis of formal and informal institutions. There is a kind of traditional narrative that says, uh, which um, has been uh, revised by many scholars, including people in this room, um, that, but in, you know, 20 years ago, uh, many people would argue China was an, era, uh, an area that was characterized by informal mechanisms. You had extensive family and lineage groups, native place groups, uh, the absence of formal kinds of institutions like Europeans' formal laws, uh, contract law, local courts, and constitutions. And what this kind of contrast meant, especially in development, if, in the field of development economics, is the logic that those places with bad informal institutions were locked into being poor. That's a theme that's been in certain strands in the development economic literature for the last at least 10, 15 years. And uh, applied to history, it would say you can explain why China is poor because it, it had an oppressive emperor, it had uh, this reliance on family groups, et cetera, et cetera. But we've had important and crucial revisions in the last uh, more than a decade, really. Uh, Abner Greif has really uh, made cl clean, elegant uh, economic models of why informal institutions existed amongst different groups in Europe and they worked. Um, Maddie Zellen and others who've worked with her um, have demonstrated the crucial importance of formal contracts uh, and many other aspects of business organization which make sort of the caricature difference between Chinese and European forms uh, far less dramatic than they had once seemed. And once we recognize that both China and Europe had mixes of formal and informal institutions, which I think is what uh, Abner's, Abner Greif's work, Maddie Zellin, and, and the other scholars who've been um, associated with both of, uh, of them and the types of work they do, what they collectively are telling us in light of the earlier knowledge we had is both China and Europe had formal and informal institutions. So Rosenthal and I said, all right, if that's true, how can we locate differences between these places? Are the differences in terms of market institutions between large places like China and Europe, or are they differences or variations within each of those areas more than between them. In other words, one of the basic things about making comparisons is what are your units of analysis? When you recognize that the unit isn't homogeneous, can you distinguish when you're explaining variations within a unit from those variations between units? Clearly there's variations in the Chinese economy, there are variations in the European economy. We have to be sure that those variations we see within e either of these world regions, we can distinguish analytically from the key differences we want to pose between the two world regions. So for instance, of market institutions, one of the first things we notice, one of the things that challenges us to think about this analytically is that Europe has fragmented political boundaries. So the, the difficulty of thinking about economic problems within political units uh, becomes a challenge. Um, what is international trade in Europe is simply um, trade within the empire in China. But what we observe, and what people have known for a long time, is that in early modern Europe, trade across Europe was largely informal. That is to say, there was a, an inability to enforce contracts formally um, at long distance. China uh, had, this was not international trade in China, but it was also long distance trade. And we discovered long distance trade was also informal. There was the, the, the relative importance of formal contract and as the source of formal adjudication um, was also fairly small. So we, th this observation then led us to say, all right, so how do we model this? How do you actually uh, sort of explain what we're likely to find historically? Is there a parsimonious way to explain this? So we ended up uh, deciding that we would just think about two factors, the frequency of transactions and the distance between the two parties transacting. So the, the uh, graph on the left um, has 
the, the value of the payment on the vertical axis and has the distance between the borrower and lender. This is a, a, a credit issue. The way we this is a slide that shows credit on, on the horizontal axis. So the uh, blue line that stays fixed is the value of the loan, and the red line that rises is the cost of enforcing that con uh, the, the loan agreement. Uh, that is, and, the, and the intuition of this is the further apart the borrower and lender, the higher the cost of enforcing the loan and beyond a certain, in a court, formally. And so beyond a certain distance, you're not gonna rely on formal institutions like courts. You're gonna have to enforce um, these agreements in some other way. So that's the issue of distance. On the right side is the issue of frequency of transactions or the time between transactions. Um, here, the, again, the, the horizontal blue line is the value that someone receives if he cheats right now and gets away with it. And the red line is um, essentially um, you, you, get, uh, you get 10 units of value from each transaction, but what happens then is the frequency of transactions changes. So that um, the, mo the more transactions you have, that is the closer you are to the origin, um, the more value you get, and it's actually worth it to you not to cheat. But the less frequent your transactions, um, then in fact, uh, cheating is a, it, it turns out to be a good idea, um, and, and the issue is how does reputation keep you um, from cheating? And you're, you're gonna have to choose one of these mechanisms as basically being more effective uh, than the other. That's, so the intuition is that, that whether you choose formal or informal mechanisms is a function of distance and time. So let me, I'll, I'll fill this in more, or give you examples of this. First, a simple two by two table. We say that if the distance is closer than a certain distance, it's easier to enforce contracts through courts. And you're especially likely to do that if the frequency with which you do these things is infrequent. So that it's worth it for you to invest in, in, in having a court system that enforces something if you don't do it that often and it's at a close enough distance that the two parties can be brought together. Um, that's the logic of why you would use formal. Um, the farther you go away, the upper right hand corner, formal becomes less feasible. But if the time is also not very frequent, you probably can't enforce things informally either. And so we would predict you only see cash being used in that case. Uh, in the lower right hand corner, where you're still at a great distance, um, but the frequency of transactions is frequent, then some form of reputation is likely to be able to that is informal mechanisms are likely to work to make trade possible. And in the, the cell in the lower left, it turns out you can have conceivably either a formal or informal mechanism. Now there are empirical things that we can associate with each of these. And what's significant is the degree to which they're both, the, that the contrasts obtain in both China and Europe. That is, there was, we can see distance and time operating in similar ways, whether you're in China or in Europe, or whether you're working between them. So that upper right part of the box where we see neither formal nor informal, the example is initially when Europeans go to China and they buy Chinese goods and they bring silver to pay for them, uh, they have to bring all the silver. Chinese don't offer any credit. There's no, there's no um, uh, credit dimension to the transaction because there's no trust in future transactions. Uh, the transactions are not frequent enough um, to create the informal mechanisms to expand those distances. If we look at where we find formal institutions, we find that for land, whether you're in China and Europe, there will be contracts. So in the Chinese case, even though a transaction could be between kin or people who are in the same native place, there's still going to be there's likely going to be a contract. So it's not that informal trumps formal in all cases. You still have contracts for land in China as you do in Europe, or at least something similar. On the other hand, where there's no formal but you have informal, that was the lower right of that two by two, that's long distance trade. In long distance trade, whether you're in Europe or in China, uh, both family and reputation matter to both. 
And then in that cell where you could have either formal or informal, um, you find both. And that's true in both parts of the world. So the first thing we establish is the stylized contrast between Europeans having formal institutions and Chinese having informal is exaggerated. There's a baseline of similarity that can be explained by factors of distance and time, frequency of transactions and distance of the parties connected by transactions. But that said, we then want to go to a second level analysis and say, but there are, there's a significance to, to, to political scale. The size of the, of the uh, political unit will influence the relative importance of these two mechanisms. So what we do, oh, is we have a blank slide. Well, I'm gonna say that's one he wrote. Um, oh, there it is, yeah, that's the rest of it. I see, so here, here's the rest of the slide. Um, so what we, what essentially this three by three does is it develops the intuition and lays out that if in fact the Chinese, because they had a, a large imperial space, developed more long distance trade earlier than Europeans, which broadly speaking seems to make sense according to the, the qualitative evidence that exists, then what this means is that they developed informal mechanisms more fully at an earlier stage than Europeans did and therefore the capacity of informal mechanisms to work well will cover more cases than it will in Europe. Conversely, because Europeans develop formal institutions, that is courts and contracts, in larger numbers earlier on, that is to deal with uh, kinds of transactions closer at hand, they were, they, because they had developed these, they could extend them more easily. So the, the extension of the kinds of institutions you initially develop covers space coming from either direction. Chinese are more likely to use certain kinds of informal institutions in areas where either could be used, and Europeans are more likely to use formal. Um, that's essentially what these inequalities uh, express um, in sort of a notional form. Um, so what we're trying to do is give a, an explanation for how China and Europe, in very important ways in terms of market institutions, can obey similar basic principles but the relative importance of how those institutions develop is influenced by political scale and the way political scale influences the way uh, trade develops. Uh, that at least is the, is the nature of our argument. Now the implications of this, as I say, if, if long distance trade develops earlier in China and develops to a greater degree, the use of informal institutions is going to have uh, more potential for extension than it does in, in Europe and the converse, uh, the converse in Europe in terms of formal institutions. Um, and what this means then as a corollary is that the, the unwillingness to provide formal institutions uh, in China is not a sign that um, informal will always prevail in China. It could simply be that it's an affirmation of, of, of the of uh, effectiveness of the, of the institutions that are, are being used. And what we do see in China, certainly in the late 19th, early 20th century, is increasing shifts to formal institutions, or rather informal institutions in some ways becoming more formal, that's one of the things that happens, um, uh, with change over time. So the key is these economies change and the role of different institutions does evolve. There isn't the kind of lock-in that some development economists imagine that if you have informal institutions, you never get rid of them unless you just sort of blow them up and import formal institutions from abroad, but rather uh, economies historically are able to have their institutions change over time. Um, and that uh, it, in both China and Europe, we can see the relevance of both formal and informal institutions. So the, the takeaway that matters for thinking about economic history is institutional, at any moment in time, what exists in terms of the institutions, their formal institutions, informal institutions, affects what's going to happen subsequently, but it doesn't lock it in. It's not as if institutions don't change. And, and in some sense, within economics at least, uh, a certain theme of path dependence, it seems to us for this kind of purpose has been oversold. All right, so where does this lead us? Um, I want to conclude by suggesting some of the ways that we have, um, we're proposing an agenda in our book. Um, we, you know, this is, ours was not a book intended to start a debate, and it's certainly not a book that intends to end a debate. 
but rather we're trying to ex uh, exemplify uh, ways to develop research and the conversation amongst people working on different parts of the world in a common research uh, effort. So let me relate some of the things that happened in the book to um, two sets of issues. One has to do with culture and ideas because Rosenthal and I were very careful. Uh, we, have, we actually take ideas quite seriously, but not in the way that at least historians in the last 15, 20 years think of ideas. And thus, we're very careful not to invoke culture uh, in some abstract way. In comparisons between China and Europe, issues of culture or the term culture has been invoked in multiple ways and we think typically in ways that are difficult to evaluate. Uh, culture is used by some historians the way some people, usually not economists, invoke the market. In, in some abstract sense, culture and market are equally unusable as concepts to explain anything because they're simply too general. So I want to say a few things about how we do think about ideas or how we use them in this book, and then I want to uh, draw some linkages between past and present that seek to uh, demonstrate why we think it's important to observe practices in earlier periods, even if they didn't themselves lead to industrialization, they can affect the way in which modern economic growth takes place at a later time. So culture and how we bring it back in, uh, and in a sense, it's, we do it carefully, or we hope we do. We avoid what are typically considered cultural explanations because those are non-falsifiable. Anytime you say Europeans believed X and therefore they did Y, then you say, well, you know, Chinese didn't believe X and so they didn't have Y. Well, there's no real way, there's no data you can assemble that would ever say that's wrong. I mean, because you've, you've, the game is over by just saying Europeans have it, Chinese don't, therefore. There, and that may, I mean, in a sense, is that true or not true? There's no real way to tell, it seems, I mean, in a, in a strict sort of sense. And so the truth value of that's hard to establish. That's why it's non-falsifiable. That doesn't seem a good way to build knowledge. Um, so as you can, Rosenthal and Wong are definitely people who believe you can build knowledge. Um, and so um, we're not, so we don't fall into the crowd that, I remember once Marshall Solins in a talk when someone criticized something he was saying, that he did not suffer from so much epistemological hypochondria that he didn't think there was a world out there. <laughs> and so we think there's a world out there and we think we can do something to uh, understand it. So, uh, but with cultural explanations, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to specify the causal mechanisms. And typically, we run a bunch of, of, of traits together and we don't know which ones are necessary, which are incidental, whether it's the conjunction of them or if there are a few key ones, it's very hard to parse. And indeed, in those instances, famous instances where cultural values have been invoked to have causal consequences, it seems people don't often recall that one of the classic cases, uh, namely Max Weber, the whole point of the Protestant ethic was the degree to which there were unintended consequences of religious beliefs for economic behavior. It was not they weren't Protestant in order to grow their economies. And, and that's, and yet, and, and no one actually literally says it that way, but if, if you think about the ways in which we think about cultural variables, often there's an intentionality uh, associated with some of them that um, is anxiety provoking in terms of making explanations. At the same time though, we do ar argue that ideas matter and we try to suggest how. Certainly we believe that the ideas of Chinese political economy fit a large polity. They make sense in terms of how and why that state promotes material security. And that those ideas inform the way institutions develop and the way institutions develop purposes, or, or rather people using institutions have purposes. So in economic terms, it means if you're gonna look at the economic consequences of ideas and beliefs, we have to recognize that those ideas and beliefs are mediated by and uh, made implementable through institutions. Those are what inform and promote certain kinds of behaviors and discourage others. Uh, and I should say by institutions, I'm using, the, uh, the term is being used the way economists use institutions, that is to say, as opposed to sociologists. Institutions are a set of rules and norms that govern behavior. That's what institutions are. 
Um, so ideas and beliefs on economic matters um, change within a culture. It's not the culture that matters. It's the kind of ideas and beliefs that exist within a culture that can be drawn upon and which can be open to new ideas from without as well as elaboration and transformation of ideas within. And it's how those ideas work upon institutions that ultimately affect both the choices people make as well as the kind of outcomes. I'm sorry, you guys see my back the whole time. And you probably can't, can you even see this up here? Oh, you do, okay, good. Sorry about that. Um, um, so some of the ideas in institutions of political economy that emerge in China, we try to show are actually similar to what we find in Europe. And others are quite different. Um, and it's the effort to uh, sort through both and evaluate when differences do and don't matter and to acknowledge similarities often are significant um, that the book is dedicated to um, soaring through. Finally, then the final point has to do with, as we're explaining economic change historically, our basic argument is we want to see if we can explain where there's economic success by explaining how institutions of different sorts enable what levels and kinds of success. And that we should be able to use general kinds of principles, locate their operation in a particular context, and therefore explain with the use of theory what's going on historically. Now, if we end up, as I alluded to before, thinking that economic success, the Industrial Revolution, for instance, uh, and essentially, if you look at all the things written on the Industrial Revolution, um, some scholar has said everything that existed in Europe, if you add it all up, everything that existed in England in 1750 to 1780 was important. Uh, and for each of those individual scholars, whatever they wrote about was important. But how we adjudicate the relevance of the, the, all those many different individual importances is A, difficult, and B, doesn't give us the basis upon which to generate general explanations of economic change uh, of any particular kind, or more general. I don't mean universal, but I mean more general than, beyond, that is to say, beyond Great Britain. So, and the exercise that comparative economic history often engages in, that is the inference that I can show you reasons why Great Britain was more successful therefore means I can show you why other places were less successful, that whole logic is a problematic um, set of assumptions behind it um, that are hard to substantiate. And our book tries to uh, demonstrate um, where that kind of reasoning leads people astray. So in the end then, in terms of long-term history, what this beyond divergence issue we raise, um, long-term history really matters. Um, Jean Laurent was born and raised in Provence, but he, he went to read college as an undergrad. So he, he both came to the US, but a very strange place in the US. <laughs> um, he also actually, this, I don't know how, why this matters, but in a sense it does. He did an undergraduate degree in history. I did mine in economics. He grew up and decided to be an economist. I got older and decided I wanted to be an historian. So we, we reversed in, in, in graduate school. Um, but I guess in a sense, he remains a very committed, close reader of history, and a commitment to uh, long durée kind of history is something we, um, we tend to share as a, as, a, as a principle, I guess. In any event, what we do in this book is, is claim that um, political scale matters, and it, for economic change in particular in the pre-industrial era, it mattered specifically for the likelihood of developing long distance commerce. If you have an imperial space, a Pacific space, in which that government is providing peace and security in broad measure, then you should expect commerce, um, if all other things being equal, it will develop more easily. Um, and we furthermore then um, argue that uh, the consequences of the changes, what made for Europe's development of uh, industry and capital intensive uh, technology uses, much of that change was unanticipated. Uh, prior to 1800, no European was planning industrialization. I mean, that just wasn't in the, in the game. And yet, if you look back at how economic historians talk about the early modern period, you would think these states were deliberately promoting uh, 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 policies that were intended to create uh, industrialization. And it, this is a kind of anachronistic argument in, in most cases. 
But once the Industrial Revolution happens, by the 1820s, certainly by 1850, the issue of, of, of how uh, other world regions will either imitate or reject what is either English or increasingly more European generally, that is a fundamentally different set of circumstances that existed um, up through the late 18th century. And so that as we recognize the game changer that the Industrial Revolution is, um, and I now recall that Jean Laurent must have written this slide because I would never say game changer, but in any event, uh, I'm saying it now, it's a game changer. Um, <laughs> and uh, what this means is that when other, other places have the opportunity to, to industrialize, the way they will do so will continue to be influenced by practices that predate industrialization. Uh, and I'm, I think the last slide will, will explain this. Uh, and I, I, I'm going to insert it parenthetically that unlike the book we wrote, the book really is, uh, was written by doing heavy outlining before one of us started writing, then the other one took anything that was written and rewrote it, and it was rewritten enough times um, that it's, it's actually not clear, at least to me, typically, who's responsible for which paragraphs. Uh, in, in, in preparing this talk, I have to admit, uh, we each took blocks and wrote different parts, so um, I'm still being reminded by different choices of, of, of words that we have. Uh, so the implications for analyzing more recent changes. Um, we argue that changes in institutional practices can come not merely from adopting foreign ones, but by elaborating and changing domestic ones. So when we look, for instance, in recent Chinese history to the 1980s and the explosion of what are called township and village enterprises, which were these small-scale industries outside the planned economy and outside of large cities, what we see, in our opinion, is the reliance on various kinds of informal mechanisms and institutions to expand market exchange and organize production that are, in no sense, the same as existed before, but they are drawing upon the, the institutional preferences that people at least had quite distinct from what the state imposed. So that what we want to suggest more generally is the particular institutional mixes that account for how industrialization takes place in different parts of the world, the institutional mixes, what's formal, what's informal, the nature of informal, these will vary. There's no single optimal mix of institutions. Institutional evolution is context specific. Um, and the notion of there being principles according to which we can evaluate institutions, but not imagining that there's a universal optimal type of mix, it seems to us is an important um, observation, argument, or suggestion. Ul ultimately then, the challenge it seems to us in doing economic history and thinking about the relevance of economic history to the more recent times is to recognize th that Historical factors matter as much as systemic. Systemic meaning the, the context of relations that a given place has with other places, be these economic or political. Um, and that there are spatial variations um, as well as common elements that characterize different situations and our challenge is really to uh, simultaneously identify both. What's varied amongst different situations and what connects them uh, in terms of uh, necessary principles or, or common phenomena because of systemic connections. Um, I could talk about the EU and things like that, which I'm tempted to do, but I know I'm running out, I've run over out of time, so I, I will um, exercise self-restraint before I'm uh, restrained um, and, and stop there. So, thank you. Thank you.